Welcome to another Founder Wisdom podcast. We have Mark R. Kester with us today. Mark is the founder at the Players Nail. He's the former president and CEO at Sports Studio Ventures LLC and is board at Sports Philanthropy Network today. So we're going to talk about sports today. Uh, Mark has an impressive career. He's a thought leader and author, public speaker, and athlete advocate. This podcast is presented to you by podpire.com. If you want to start scale, be invited to podcasts like this one, go to podpire.com. Mark, welcome to the pod. Tell me a bit more about yourself and what you're up to nowadays. Joss, thank you for uh, the introduction and thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, I'm in a very unique space here in the United States uh, since July of 2021, college athletes are able to monetize and take advantage of their name, image, and likeness. We refer to it as NIL rights, essentially allowing them to be athletes, uh, athletic influencers. And um, now we have 34 states in the United States that allow it in high school. So it's a fast moving and crazy space, but athletes as influencers is here in the marketing space to stay. Right. Tell us about the business model, who you target, and how do you make money off this? So the industry is fast-paced and moving because it's less than three years old. So there's no precedent. There's no gold standard. There's a couple of different uh, industry segments. I happen to be in one called education. So I'm all about empowering athletes to build their personal brand, to create opportunities for themselves. My business is a straightforward one at the high school level. It's direct to consumer. We have an asynchronous online learning system designed by education PhD, educational PhDs. And at the college and university level, we sell that same program through group licensing. And you started in sports apparel, I believe. Uh, tell us about that earlier part of your career. Yeah, so prior to this, for the previous 15 years, I was in Los Angeles running a company called Sports Studio. And it was there that we produced what we call scripted sports content. So TV shows, movies, and commercials. So during that process, I learned about athletes as marketers, um, agents, production companies, group licensing, sponsorship sales, really a great precursor to this name, image, and likeness space that I'm in today. Right, and tell us about the opportunity in NIL vs uh, representing a professional athlete. Uh, yeah, tell us about the difference and the opportunity there. Yeah, so again, I'm not an agent. I don't represent athletes. I don't make deals. I don't take commissions. I'm strictly about empowering the athletes to be better sponsor partners. Agents typically represent athletes in professional sports and now in college sports to help make deals and they get paid on a percentage or commission on those total deals. And so that's a, a different segment of the business. I'm strictly taking an athlete, tell, telling his or her story, expanding their audience, growing their network so that they can leverage that with potential sponsor partners. Right. So it's like an agency service, sort of. Do you charge monthly or do you charge per contract? We sell the individual uh, lic or license content to the individual. And then in group licensing, we sell it through universities, coaches, administrators, teams, things like that. And what kind of uh, deals are we talking about, like five to six figure? Well, our online curriculum is uh, individually sold for $150. So we're all about scaling. And so we have built this pre-recorded system. It's asynchronous, which means it's self-paced self and self-learning. And so we can scale it. We could take 100 athletes or 1,000 athletes today and put them through our LMS system at their own paces, and they can follow our almost five hours of content and leadership uh, lessons that way. Oh, that's interesting. How do you target these folks via Facebook ads? or? Yeah, so that's a little bit of the challenge right now is you know bringing product awareness in an industry that's brand new. So we've done a lot of social media marketing, digital marketing, and then a lot of just personal outreach. We're trying to connect with coaches. I wrote a book called NIL for All, which is a 30-minute guide to name, image, and likeness. It's available on Amazon. It's a paperback book. And that has gotten me, you know, lots of speaking engagements and 
uh, public uh, speaking, direct to consumers uh, talks, panels, things like that. Why that industry also in the that the first place? Uh, why have you always chosen athletes as your end customers? Well, it's it's where that the news is sensationalized the opportunity athletes as influencers. But it's a great question because I think what you're asking is would it work with musicians, artists, chefs, anyone that's trying to build a personal brand needs to tell their story and grow their audience. And those are the skills that we develop, along with life skills like financial literacy, life skills like community service and philanthropy, how to connect with the place uh, that you're doing business, the town, the community. So if your question was, is it limited to athletes? The answer is no. It could work with anyone who wants to be an individual influencer. Yeah, the question is more like the importance of sports uh, in your life. Um, why athletes and, and the place that... Um, physical activity occupies in your life? Yeah. So for me personally, you know, my father was a coach when I was a teenager and uh, he taught me a very valuable lesson and it was how can you use athletics to better your life? And so I was able to do that through a college scholarship, met uh, great friends, got a great education, networking, great life skills developed during my college athletic experience. For me, it was athletics, but it could be, as we just talked about art, science, music, but for me, it was athletics. And then the second principle of our business is how do you use athletics to better the lives of the people around you? And so we've been fortunate enough to use athletics to empower young people to change their life's direction and to create opportunities for themselves. Perhaps they never thought they could get to a school that they now can get into because they have help from athletic uh, department. Or maybe they live on the wrong side of the tracks and they don't even have any peers or network that even thinks about college, but now they're exposed to the opportunities that college can create. So using athletics to better your life and then using athletics to better the lives of the people around you are the two principles of our business. So what common mistakes do you see in young athletes uh, between the ones that make it uh, to the national leagues or to success and the ones that don't make it? So I want to be clear. There's two different answers to that. One is, you know, based on their athletic experience. You know, how do athletes become professional athletes in the United States? Most of it's God-given, right? They have to be really tall. They have to be really big. They have to run fast. They have to have some skill. Of course, hard work. Of course, discipline and structure go into it. And probably as big a thing, if you talk to professional athletes, they'll say there's lots of great athletes around, but one of the biggest differentiators is the mental health, or the mental aspect. In other words, how do they handle pressure? Can they perform when it's, you know, go time? And so building a network around athletes that have a lot of physical skills but need to develop their mental and spiritual skills is something that we're working on as well. But the difference between a regular uh, everyday athlete and a professional athlete, usually God-given ability. And what mindset hacks have you seen in the grades? You've interviewed various people on your podcast you've studied various uh coaches and top athletes what uh mindset hacks have you seen in them that made them su successful self-confidence right the, the ability to not only envision yourself being successful but then have the confidence to execute a plan to get there to be humble to learn you know from your mistakes and to grow from all of your adversity uh, I think there's a lot of people that quit at an early age because they aren't mentally strong. Uh, there's a lot of people that have a lot of talent, but they don't see it through. And so the mental aspect that I see that's most important is the ability to, uh, you know, fight through adversity and overcome the challenges that everyday life presents. And how does one learn to develop grit? Yeah, grit's a funny word, but uh, again, I think there are some innate um, uh, things that you have to have. In other words, you have to be you know, a little bit self-confident, self-determined. But I think the most important thing, Charles, is that you are uh, driven to be successful and that you're willing to change the way you think or change the way you behave, change where you live, change the people that you uh, hang out with. And that self-confidence comes from experience and that experience comes from winning and losing. So I think putting yourself out there and trying different things, just like in business, taking a risk, 
uh, and seeing it through are all common traits. Have you seen self-confidence taken too far? Of course, right? We all know the athlete that thinks, you know, that they're better than they are or they project an image that's, you know, above everyone else or, you know, they haven't really been faced with adversity and they think they're successful because of something that they did. Uh, some athletes are given great opportunities. You know, they were born in the right family. They have the right financial resources. They have the ability to hire coaches at a young age. So, um, you know, there's a lot of people that have been successful, but hasn't been because they've worked hard. It's because they were lucky and plopped into a, a great opportunity. So we see athletes all the time that probably are a little bit over the top when it comes to social media, for instance, or their, you know, their, their, their thoughts on social media. Yeah, well, we've seen uh, Johnny Football, I guess, recently. Uh, he had a, a big uh, downfall. I guess he took it a bit too uh, easy and he couldn't handle the pressure. Like, how do you make sure that your young athletes keep their mental health uh, as a priority? Well, again, I think it comes from confidence, right? And so, you know, it's just a psych psychology example right you know there's lots of people that are insecure in their life for different reasons um and they try and compensate for that and they overcompensate by being overconfident right or projecting a level of overconfidence so somewhere deep i'm not a psychologist and i don't know johnny football johnny manzel but my guess is that somewhere deep inside um he had not made the sacrifices that he needed to be successful and, and then he became successful by almost, you know, just circumstances, and he couldn't sustain it because he didn't put the work into it. That's my opinion. Right. So as an athlete uh, nowadays, I guess recovery is an important topic as well. Uh, when's the right time to uh, take it easy? That's a pretty open-ended question. You know, I think it depends on, you know, both physically and mentally where you're at, Right but certainly balance in life. And that's one of the things we teach at the Players NIL, Charles, is, you know, if your whole self-worth is because you can run fast and jump high and nothing else, when that's taken away, you don't have very much to fall back on. But if you have uh, interest outside of sports, again, math, science, art, uh, fashion, music, these types of things, and you have a balanced life, you're able to sustain your um, your intensity longer because you're not relying on just one thing to be successful or to make yourself feel good. So uh, physically, we see lots of young kids that are pushed too far, playing sports year-round, playing the same sport year-round, specialization. I think that's dangerous. Uh, we see kids that are playing for the wrong reasons, right, because their parents want them to, because some coach is making them do it. And so I think, you know, we have a real mental health crisis around athlete uh, and athletic specialization and the proliferation of youth sports in the United States. What are your recommendations as a coach? Uh, does it depend on the style of player or does tough love work better than, you know, emotional stuff? Yeah, well, I think it's the same as being a parent and I'm a parent of five children and One of my many philosophies is that, you know, good parents, if you can imagine a highway out in the country and good drivers stay down the middle of the road, right? Good parents stay down the middle of the road. On one side of the road are the parents that are out of control and crazy, right? And just, you know, helicopter parents. On the other side of the road are the parents that are not present. They don't care. They're not committed. They're not involved in their children's life. They're absent, right? And I think all parents drive to try to drive down the middle of the road, but for some reason they get pushed to one side or the other. Good parents come back to the middle of the road. Parents that are unhealthy stay on one side or the other. And I think coaching is the same way. So I think parenting and coaching is similar in that you have to understand that sometimes it's hugs and kisses and sometimes it's kicks in the rear end. It takes a little of both. Your uh, athletes, you also teach them goal setting uh, to have some structure in their days and their weeks? Of course, discipline is one of the most important, you know, personality traits in life. Again, whether you're going to be, you know, employee or you're going to own a business, build a business, 
going to be a parent, going to be a friend. You have to make sacrifices. And I think uh, there is a systematic approach to life that works. You know, have the end goal, have the steps and development stages written down, understand the steps that you need to take to accomplish those milestones and um, set out with that plan. And don't be afraid to change the plan if it isn't working. And what are your goals this year? Well, you know, we built this company to change thousands of kids' lives. So uh, my goal is to, to reach thousands of kids with NIL education as the platform to give them life skills so that they can be successful, you know, in athletics and outside of athletics. How can you accelerate your way into that goal and reach it in a couple of months instead of a year? Well, I'm a little bit handicapped because the industry is new and young. And so we're still educating people around what name, image, and likeness is. And so we're, you know, actively and vocally trying to educate people to do that. You know, it's force multiplying, I call it. It's going on podcasts like yours. You know, if one person listens to this that buys my book or registers for my class and they like it and they tell somebody, we've multiplied the message. And so that's why I'm up to almost 900 Zoom calls since I started the business. I talk to people all day, every day about what we're doing, and I try to force multiply my message. So I studied YMCA uh, not so long ago, and uh, volleyball was invented there. Uh, basketball was invented there, too. What are trendy sports nowadays, and how can one invent new sports that go trending? Well, that's, I don't know, that's a difficult, I think the fastest growing sport in America now is pickleball, right? It's, it's really taken the country by storm because I think it's a combination of lots of things that people like, right? It's active. It's typically outdoors. Um, anyone can play from age eight, six, five, all the way up to age 80. Um, it's relatively injury free. So that's been a great sport that's developed in, I don't know, last less than 10 years, perhaps, right? Um, I think football is evolving, American football. We're now looking at, you know, seven-on-seven seven football versus full-field football. Flag football is the fastest-growing segment of football right now. We're going to have flag football in the 2028 Olympics in Los Angeles. So there's a, two examples, pickleball and flag football, that are growing tremendously. I don't know what the next sport will be, but I think there's probably some models around team sports that can change And that'll be, we'll see some variation of existing sports. What do you think about Dana White's power slap? You know, I personally am not a huge uh, uh, UFC fan. It's not that I'm against it. I just don't know a lot about it. I see UFC growing. There's another example. And I see the fan base growing. I've seen some clips of power slap. I honestly don't understand it. So it's hard for me to comment on it. What are your thoughts on Deion Sanders? Well, I think it's a tremendous story. I just wrote about it on LinkedIn today. Uh, I think he's changing sports culture in America single-handedly. I think he's one of the biggest disruptors in college athletics has ever seen. And uh, if you follow this week, he's starting to talk about how uh, his athletes are going to participate in the NFL combine and draft next year. And he's saying that they're not as a matter of fact, and they're not going to be traditional participants. And I wouldn't bet against Deion Sanders in anything that he says he's going to do. And I think he's going to disrupt the National Football League more than they want. And it's going to be really interesting to watch and see. Where can people find out more about you, Mark? The name of our company is The Players NIL. We're on theplayersnil.com. We're on all social media platforms at The Players NIL. And you can buy my book, NIL for All, on Amazon. It's available there. It's a 30-minute read and a paperback.